Where are the girls? Part of the answer is a home in San Diego. Details on the shelter for migrant children as a deadline to reunite families is just hours away. And to go there now and just see, you know, what I've um, worked so hard to have is it's just gone. Her home was one of many destroyed by the weekend's fire in Alpine. We'll show you more of the damage as people begin the recovery process. There's still so much more at stake. And so with him being gone, what's at jeopardy is LGBT rights. And persist with pride. The leader of Pride San Diego talks about this year's event as change comes to the Supreme Court. KPBS Evening Edition starts right now. Hello, thanks for joining us. I'm Ebony Monet. The Trump administration will not meet a court-ordered deadline to reunite young children separated from their parents at the border. As Terramento reports, only about half of the children under five have been reconnected. A federal judge in San Diego set a deadline of tomorrow for the Trump administration to reunify 102 young children with their parents. But a Justice Department lawyer said today it will only be able to reunify about 50 to 60 kids. That's because some parents have already been deported or in criminal custody, and others have not yet been identified or verified as related to the child. The ACLU's Lee Gallant is a representing families in a class action lawsuit over the separations. He says he is disappointed that the administration will miss the deadline, but is pleased with the judge's efforts. Their deadlines are going to be expanded for any individuals. He is looking like he is going to order very strict new deadlines and keep them, their feet to the fire, requiring status reports continuously so that they have to take very specific steps each day to get the job done. Another hearing is scheduled tomorrow. The administration is also facing a July 26 deadline to reunify more than 2,000 children that are over five years old. Taryn Mento, KPBS News. As the Trump administration scrambles to meet the deadline, one question has remained unanswered. Where are the girls? The government has not let journalists see facilities where it detains migrant girls, only boys. But KPBS Fronteras reporter Jean Guerrero has found one of the girls' shelters in San Diego. On a quiet residential street in Lemon Grove, a two-story beige house sits on a hill. It looks like a normal house, except for all the no trespassing signs in the driveway. The house is a detention facility for at least six migrant girls, run by the nonprofit Southwest Key, which declined to comment on the facility or to let KPBS inside. From the outside, it's a far cry from the cages and tent cities used to detain migrant children in Texas, or the cold detention centers known as yeleras, or freezers, that Customs and Border Protection uses in San Diego and elsewhere. A Zillow listing for the property says it's a five-bedroom, three-bathroom house, valued at nearly $900,000. Neighbors like Hollis Barber say the girls seem well taken care of. They have like five or six of those vans, and they take girls somewhere, somewhere in the mornings, or they come back in the evenings. But Barber and other neighbors have put up no parking signs on their driveways, because Border Patrol and other vehicles visiting the girls will sometimes fill up the street. KPBS confirmed that the house was a Southwest Key girls' shelter by cross-referencing documents and speaking to employees on condition of anonymity. It's unclear how many of the girls have been separated from their parents. The lack of information regarding where the girls are being kept has given rise to conspiracy theories about human trafficking on social media. The government has attributed its secrecy to a need to safeguard the privacy of the children. But the girls' backyard is clearly visible from the backyards of several neighbors. Male and female residents of the neighborhood report seeing the girls exercising and stretching on a sprawling three-level backyard. Before 2006, the house was a group home for abused and neglected boys. Jean Guerrero, KPBS News. 
Federal courts have been struggling to keep up with a higher caseload. Judges in San Diego are now hearing cases not individually, but in groups. KPBS reporter Andrew Bowen explains Operation Streamline. The number of cases of misdemeanor illegal entry into the United States has skyrocketed since the Trump administration imposed its zero tolerance policy. Now that's overwhelmed the federal courts behind me. And Operation Streamline is an effort to process more of these cases more quickly. I watched some of the proceedings earlier this afternoon, and here's how it goes. It's more or less similar to a regular criminal trial, but about six to eight defendants sit in the jury box all at once. The judge explains their rights and asks them how they want to plead. Earlier in the day, they had just a few hours to consult with their appointed attorneys. I spoke with one of those attorneys who said this whole process is just unjust. The zero tolerance just takes out the individualized determination for each individual case. Some of these people have righteous claims to asylum. Some of these people, because of their language barriers by, you know, not speaking Spanish or English, you know, should be handled in an individualized fashion. And when you have zero tolerance, you're taking any individualized attention away from a particular case with its own particular problems. And I think that that system is not a system that we should be proud of. Now, Operation Streamline has been around for more than a decade, and it has been used in other parts of the country before, but today was the first day it was used in San Diego. The federal defenders here believe it will now be used indefinitely, meaning this could be the new normal. Reporting from the federal courthouse downtown, Andrew Bowen, KPBS News. A wildfire that burned through Alpine on Friday destroyed 34 homes. KPBS reporter Matt Hoffman spoke with one of the victims trying to recover. We get grandma kids? No. Lisa Ford still can't believe what happened to her home last week. They had it all caution taped off, but I didn't care. I just wanted to go in there and just try to find something that was my grandmother's or my dad's. And I was able to find a couple of little uh, glass trinkets. Ford lives at the Alpine Oaks Estates, which was one of the first areas hit by the West Fire. I heard the neighbors all like, come on, let's go, let's go. And so I just grabbed like, just a few items, not even clothes or anything, and I just, I just figured, well, the fire is not going to jump all the way over here and get me. Ford was able to get out, but her home was destroyed. She says one of her daughters saw the house burning on the news. And she's like, Mom, it's gone, it's all gone. And I go, no, no, it's not all gone. She goes, no, I got the picture right here. I'm going to send it to you. It was my mobile home up in flames, and I, my knees just buckled. I just was just in utter shock. I couldn't believe how the fire moved so rapidly. Desperate to find valuables, Ford has already started digging through what's left of her home. At this point, it's just a pile of rubble, you know, with ashes and stuff. It's, it's been just utterly devastating, really. Um, and to go there now and just see you know, what I've um, worked so hard to have is, is just gone. Ford says she was only able to grab some valuables and cash before evacuating. For the last few days, she's been staying with family and friends while she figures out her next move. I really don't know what my, my options are going to be, you know, financially for that. Um, I know that no matter what my future holds, I don't want to be away from my, my grandkids. At a county assistance center in Alpine Monday, she got some spending money from the American Red Cross. FEMA wasn't there, but Ford plans to see if she's eligible for federal aid. Matt Hoffman, KPBS News. Due to the fires burning across California, the state attorney general is warning about price gouging. The governor has declared a state of emergency after the fire in Alpine. That distinction makes price gouging illegal for items like food, medical supplies, and gas. Gouging is defined by charging in an excess of 10% more than the original price before a state of emergency. After a heat wave this weekend, now there's a chance of thunderstorms in parts of our area. Erin Calandra has details in tonight's forecast. 
I hope you had a great weekend and a good start to the new work week. We are tracking some storms. It is finally monsoon season. We have moisture coming up from the south. Widespread showers and storms, especially in the interior areas. The coast is looking pretty nice, a lot cooler than it was because it was pretty hot around here. But look at this radar, the satellite. It is more active than we have seen in quite some time with some scattered showers and storms for nearly everyone. That's how it looks for the whole southwest. Scattered showers and storms in New Mexico, Arizona, and Southern California. For tonight, we could see a couple of storms popping up across the metro. 70 degrees. Most people will stay dry, but spotty activity. And that's how it looks across the county. Borrego Springs at 80 tonight. Mount Laguna at 64. San Diego reaching 70 for the low. Tomorrow looks a lot like today. We're going to see more showers and storms and uh, especially in the interior areas here. We do have concerns for flash flooding. The ground is so dry in these areas that these downpours won't be absorbed very well with that dry ground. So flash flooding is something to keep in mind. You might need the umbrella in Mount Laguna tomorrow, San Diego as well. Very spotty activity. So other regions, we can't rule out a shower, but you will also see mostly sunny skies. Borrego Springs at 101. San Diego closer to average at 79 degrees. We should be right around 74 this time of year. Now this rain is going to be great news for everyone because we are seeing an exceptional drought condition here in the Four Corners. Widespread extreme and across much of San Diego, uh, San Diego County, a severe drought. So rain is a positive thing around here. This week it's going to stay mostly sunny along the coast. Temperatures in the 80s by the weekend dipping down to 79. Some storms around in the interior areas Tuesday. Drier conditions can't rule out some spotty storms Wednesday. Temperatures will hold steady in the 80s. In the mountains, a couple of storms around pretty much all week. Uh, and temperatures will stay in the upper 70s to low 80s. And in the deserts, we are going to be cooking here in the triple digits with some pop-up showers and storms. For KPBS News, I'm Erin Calandra. Ebony, back to you. President Donald Trump will announce his nominee to the Supreme Court tonight. One group that will be watching closely is San Diego's LGBT community. Earlier, we talked with the executive director of San Diego Pride about the political roots of the organization. While we have been struggling um, for many decades, the LGBT movement and specifically Pride was founded off of the Stonewall Riots when our community fought back against the legal oppression and discrimination and violence that our community was facing. And we continue to face those struggles day after day, year after year, decade after decade in this long fight for equality and justice. And it was important to us to honor that legacy and honor the ongoing fight that is still lays ahead of us. And so we felt like Persist with Pride really encapsulated that. So the struggles that we were facing in 1969 were that it was illegal to be homosexual. Engaging in homosexual acts was considered illegal. And it was legal to lobotomize gay men in the state of California until 1976. And while we've made a lot of gains and a lot of progress, it's still legal to not employ people because they're LGBT in 28 different states or to throw people out of their homes. So we really are still fighting for the right to access life-saving services and care and public accommodations and so while we've made a lot of gains on marriage and certain employment rights in certain states, uh, that fight is still very real for many of us all across the country. Justice Kennedy was so integral to LGBT court cases that helped us gain many of those rights. Whether it was the Lawrence v. Texas case or the Obergefell, Windsor, and Perry cases that led to marriage rights, um, there's still so much more at stake. And so with him being gone, what's at jeopardy is LGBT rights. And I think it's hard for folks to sometimes understand that showing up to vote at the polls means electing people in office who will then appoint people to a Supreme Court that then will translate to the very real day-to-day -day life that you will live and your ability to access life-saving services and care. And so our hope is that people really turn out to the polls in November to make a statement that our community isn't going away. I think for many people, 
uh, I think for many LGBT people, we don't get to be authentically ourselves any day of the week. And that is true for people who are non-LGBT too. So at the end of the day, I really hope that people who participate in Pride this week just have the experience of being themselves in daylight, which is something that none of us have for most of the time in our lives, or we don't have all year round. But for one week in a year, we get to hold hands and we get to express our love in the daylight. And that's so important for folks. Voters are more engaged this year, and the proof is in the numbers. As Tom Fudge reports, local turnout saw a big jump in the June 5th primary election. Okay, a 40% turnout may not seem impressive to those who think everybody should vote in every election, but the turnout in San Diego County's June primary of 39.8% to be exact is a lot higher than it was in the same primary four years ago when only about 27% turned out. San Diego County Registrar of Voters Michael Vu says more than 673,000 San Diegans voted in June. You're seeing essentially 150,000 more people cast a ballot in this election than they did four years ago. Vu says any candidate who wants a recount will have until Tuesday to request it. In one San Diego City Council race, only three votes separated the candidate who advanced to the general election and one who didn't. Tom Fudge, KPBS News. The North County Transit District is buying new coaster trains. The board approved a plan to add five new trains to its fleet at a cost of $37 million. Some of the money will come from gas tax revenue. The transit board says the new trains will be cleaner burning than the trains being replaced. Some are more than 40 years old. San Diego has a new website for tracking its campaign to end all traffic deaths by 2025. But KPBS Metro reporter Andrew Bowen says it's got some problems. First of all, the data on the city's new Vision Zero webpage is off. It says there were 33 traffic deaths in 2016, but the city's open data portal says the real number is almost double that, 64. A city spokeswoman said she was looking into the discrepancy. Judy Tentor of the nonprofit Bike San Diego says she's less concerned about the data glitch than she is about the overall messaging from the city. We have such a strong car culture and a, a culture that encourages speed, encourages getting to your destination as fast as possible. And I think that needs to change. We need to slow down and then everybody will be safer. To see a map of where the city plans to make street safety improvements in the next year, go to kpbs.org. Andrew Bowen, KPBS News. A local author is crediting the crisis house in El Cajon with helping her tell her story. Love Incorruptible, a woman's reflective journey to freedom, is a novel, but Jasmine still drew upon real life experiences. So when Brooklyn came to a crossroads in her marriage, she decided to not blame her spouse, no longer blame her parents or her childhood. She wanted to really find out why she was making these poor choices. So she dug deep and she went all the way back to the age of six and started walking through some of those traumas and experiences and really made the connection to those things and the choices she was making as an adult. Still had a book launch event and fundraiser for the Crisis House over the weekend. She says the organization gave her financial help when she needed it, and she wanted to pay it forward. The Smithsonian calls it the worst sea disaster in U.S. naval history. A new book looks at the sinking of the USS Indianapolis during World War II. Those who escaped the wreckage drifted for days in shark-infested waters. KPBS Roundtable host Mark Sauer recently talked with the book's co-author. Sarah Vladek, welcome. Thank you. Let's just start in. Recap the story for us of the Indianapolis uh, briefly and tell us what drew you to become so involved in this story. Well, you know, the Indianapolis, it's known for the sinking and what the men went through, but it really is a magnificent ship. It was Spruance's flagship. It was Roosevelt's ship of state. You know, this ship was really one of the main players in the end of the Pacific War. And so she had this majesty to her that most people don't know. And that, that drew me. I mean, initially the sinking and what took place with the Japanese torpedoes after she had carried the atomic bomb was what drew me in. But then over the years, learning the story of the ship and just what she was involved in, the role she played in World War II really fascinated me. 
And the story really got obscure because she dropped off one of the, delivered the bomb here. And of course, soon after, we had the atomic bombings, the end of the war, and that was obviously the big international story. But this tragedy was, was so horrible and it really got obscured at that time. It did, and most people didn't even know that it happened at the time because the day they announced it you know, to the world, it was the same day that Japan surrendered. And so in the small print in the back of the paper was a line that said, Indianapolis sunk 100% casualty but everyone was celebrating the end of the war. All right, and tell us how many men were on the ship, two torpedoes hit it, it went down in, in 12 minutes, and give us kind of the, uh, the box score, as it were, of this tragedy. Yeah, well, there were 1,195 crew members, there was actually four, 1,194 crew members, one passenger who just happened to you know, hitch a ride and, on this fated trip, and 316 survived. So they were torpedoed, the ship sank in 12 minutes, and the men were in the water for five nights, four days before they were accidentally rescued, if you will. And this was warm water in the South Pacific, but that was the, the least of their problems. Right, you know, they were not in rafts, as you know, you would guess, they were in life jackets, some were on floater nets, some had nothing at all and was, were just there to swim. And so they had to survive amid shark attacks, dehydration, you know, all the elements in order to survive. And only 316 did survive. And it's so striking reading uh, the book, The Men Are in the Waters, you say five nights, four days, mm -hmm. and you chronicle life-saving heroism and, and valor, but also madness, assaults, even rape and cannibalism. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's, it really is a, a, a look at a horrific situation for human beings to be in. Yeah, I mean, it is looking at the human condition under these circumstances that you know show the best of people and the worst, of, you know, worst of people, and how they react in a situation of survival. Like, what would you do to survive? Right. And again, the the water was about 80 degrees. Uh, hypothermia eventually became a problem, mm -hmm. but it was the sharks. And of course, the movie Jaws has a reference to this this terrible incident with one of the characters, and that's probably where most Americans, if they know at all about the Indianapolis, have learned about it. Yes, the Quint monologue in Jaws is really what you know most people know the story about, and then of course Shark Week tends to highlight it every now and then. But really, you know, the ship was known for so much more and it's always obscured because of the shark story. And you've been to many of the uh, reunions of the survivors. Uh, tell us what, what those are like, and obviously as, as time goes on, fewer and fewer survivors are, are yeah. around to tell the story. Um, when I started, it was 2001 when I went to my first reunion, and there were 117 survivors attending at that time, and now there are 14 still living. And you know, this is a gathering of men who, you know, they can share stories, they reconnect. They're the only people in the world that know what happened in those waters and can kind of you know, use that as a form of therapy. And that really is what that was. Once it started, the men started talking, that helped them deal with this tragedy more than anything else could because there wasn't PTSD at that time. I mean, treatments for it and such, it wasn't identified. And nobody else could really uh, understand or comprehend Not at all. the uh, circumstances they went through. And they didn't tell their families either. So, you know, they were, most of the families had no idea their fathers or husbands went through this kind of tragedy. I mean, they knew they survived the Indianapolis, but not what that meant. Well, thank you for being here, Sarah Vladek. Thank you. I'm Judy Woodruff. Tonight on the News Hour, full analysis of President Trump's pick to replace Justice Kennedy on the Supreme Court. Coming up at 7, right after Evening Edition on KPBS. Starbucks iced coffee and frappuccinos come with a green plastic straw, but that will change in the next few years. The company has announced it will phase out the use of plastic straws by 2020. It says it wants to cut down on pollution that often ends up in the ocean. Starbucks says its new straws will be made out of paper or some other biodegradable material. Oysters are one of the top seafoods farmed in New England. There's evidence that changing ocean waters are also changing the shellfish. From WGBH News, reporter Stephanie Leiden explains the critical need to adapt. Three hours north of Boston, the Damariscotta River stretches for 15 miles, connecting a freshwater lake to the main coast. Ocean water winds out, the river's salty, ideal, it turns out, for oysters. They're growing in these cages, the heart of an oyster farm Bill Mook launched 33 years ago. What has it been like to grow oysters on this river? It's been a wonderful career. I mean, it's, uh, it is a gorgeous place. But in these pristine waters, something's changed. 
it became obvious inside the hatchery, where river water fuels an oyster breeding operation, it begins with larvae so small you need a microscope to see them. About a decade ago, they started having trouble forming a shell. It was a big problem. We were distraught. We were, we were pulling our hair out trying to figure out what was going wrong. Oyster growers from the West Coast who were hit hard by the same thing years earlier offered an answer. Ocean acidification. It's a process where carbon dioxide is absorbed in the water and, as the name suggests, makes it more acidic too acidic for oyster larvae to build a shell. We now, because of ocean acidification, have to uh, buffer the water. It's like putting tums in the water. It's putting in acid in the water. Problem solved inside the hatchery. So these are oysters that were spawned in the hatchery last year. But here on the river, where the oysters reach full size, Mook worries about what's happening. The big question I have is whether the shells are becoming thinner. Part of the answer may be in this black box. Developed by researchers at the University of New Hampshire, it measures changes in the river's acid levels. It's used to collect data not just here, but around the world, where everything from coral reef to clams could be vulnerable. It is concerning because this uh, trajectory of carbon dioxide has, has not leveled off. It's continuing to increase. Uh, on the port side? I think so. Researcher Joe Salisbury says it will take years to understand the full impact of ocean acidification, but his black box supplies real-time information, and that could help Bill Mook adapt. I've spent over half my life building this business up, and I would like it to continue. And I'd like it to continue more than just until after I retire. And so that's really what I'm, that's the focus of my effort right now. An effort to make this oyster farm resilient even as the river changes. Stephanie Leiden, WGBH News. You can find tonight's stories on our website, kpbs.org slash evening edition. Thanks for joining us. Have a great night.